All right, I think it's time for me to get started. Thank you all for coming. Um, welcome, thank you all for sticking with me to the very end. I really appreciate it. This talk is gonna be about um, identity in OpenStack, um, which is called Keystone, and its role in a multi-tenant computing environment like OpenStack. Uh, so my name's Colleen. I'm, uh, I work at SUSE. I've been there for about two years now. I work on the cloud team. Um, we build our cloud product around OpenStack, which is one of the largest open source projects uh, in the world, and uh, I've been contributing to that for a while. I'm also the PTL, or project team lead, for the Keystone project in OpenStack, and that's a community elected position that's not part of my job title at SUSE. Uh, and so that's why this talk is going to focus on the Keystone component of OpenStack. So since I work on Keystone, um, I wanted to give a talk that gives a broad introduction, sort of a high-level introduction to the Keystone project. And I'll try to make this kind of a, an honest look at Keystone and OpenStack and not just talk about why it's so great. Um, but beyond that, I'd like to sort of take a step back from this particular project and talk about multi-tenancy and why it's a hard problem and why, uh, how we try to solve it in OpenStack and with Keystone. So to set the stage, uh, these are what I think are sort of the founding principles of cloud and what makes cloud different from just regular virtualization. First of all, cloud infrastructure is multi-tenant, and second, cloud infrastructure is self-service. And those kind of go hand in hand a little bit. You can't really have one without the other. To define that a little bit more, multi-tenancy is this abstraction that lets us collaborate on virtual resources within a team or organization while also allowing these teams to securely share this underlying physical inf infrastructure between these teams and in isolation from one another without disrupting each other's workflows. Um, sharing resources like this is, uh, it's not really a new idea. Any kind of multi-user Unix system already supports multi-tenancy in some way. Uh, but what's more interesting about the way OpenStack does it is it's not just about giving individual users access to a system. It's more about allowing groups of users to collaborate on some logical section of the system. And so in the, in the cloud take on multi-tenancy, the whole thing is centered around teams of users. And moreover, a user could be a member of more than one um, team which that implies they need access to more than one tenant in the system, which is another layer of complexity that we have to program around. And so then self-service means users having full control over their applications and having the infrastructure be fully automatable, fully discoverable, never having to file a ticket with your, your cloud operator. The applications running on the system should always have enough information to uh, make their own decisions without a human's involvement, or they should be able to discover enough information about the system that they can make their own decisions. For example, when it comes to things like auto-scaling. So before I can talk about the keystone component of OpenStack, I need to explain what OpenStack is, just for anybody who's not com com completely familiar with it. Um, it's an open source cloud platform. It's usually used as a private cloud for cases where either it's more cost effective to uh, run your own cloud in your own data center or if you're concerned about data privacy and you want your data contained in one data center, but you still need the agility and flexibility that having a cloud gives you. Um, there's also different public cloud offerings running OpenStack, which is convenient because you can use the same APIs to run your workloads across multiple different providers without being locked in to a particular provider. Um, another way to look at it is as infrastructure as a service, um, where you can, you can request servers, you can request block storage, networking, all on demand, not need to ask your IT team to buy and install a new server or boot up a new VMware node. Um, and so what OpenStack is not, is it's not virtualization. It's, virtualization is a, a lower layer below the cloud. It's part of, it's part of OpenStack, but it's, OpenStack is really the abstractions on top of virtualization. And so an important thing to know about OpenStack is that it's pretty big. Um, it's developed and it's operated 
uh, as distinct building block components. Um, it's not a product that comes already put together working out of the box. It's, it's actually up to, to cloud operators and to deployers, um, installers, lifecycle managers to pick out the pieces and put them together in a particular way. So the central box here is all of the HTTP services that are part of OpenStack. And down in the corner there is Keystone, which is what we're going to focus on. So with that in mind, this is what Keystone is. It's, um, it implements the identity API for OpenStack, which means it's responsible for user management as well as for authentication and for authorization within OpenStack. And then since it's central to all the other components of OpenStack, it also acts as a discovery service. And so I'm going to talk about that functionality first because it's kind of the odd one out. Um, it doesn't really exactly fit into Keystone's role as an identity service, but discovery is kind of critical to the way OpenStack works because, because OpenStack is developed as those separate building blocks um, that are independent from one another. So the reason we make discovery part of Keystone is that Keystone happens to be central to all these other components. So it's in sort of this unique position to provide an entry point into the cloud and to act as kind of a bridge between these disjoint components. And the way it operates is, is pretty simple. Uh, the components just register the, themselves in the Keystone catalog. And so this allows clients to only have to know the Keystone URL in order to be able to find out what other services are available in the cloud and what endpoints they're at, what regions they're in. And from there, they can start figuring out what API versions each service supports. And so they can start negotiating how they're going to talk to this service. And so this discovery mechanism allows client applications to autonomously interact with a cloud without previously knowing anything about it. And that even allows um, the clients to interact with different clouds which could be configured differently. They could have different components installed, um, but they can still figure it out because of this discovery component. Um, this is kind of a representation of the catalog from a CLI point of view, but um, normally this would just be used uh, within, within the client and not really exposed to humans. And so then the most obvious part of Keystone is more the identity part of Keystone. So it can be used as an identity storage mechanism where the user information, the password hashes are all stored in the Keystone database managed directly by Keystone. But it can also act as kind of an identity broker where the information is stored in your LDAP directory and proxied through Keystone so that your organization's LDAP server can still act as that authoritative identity source. but um, users interacting with the Keystone still have the same experience as if they were local Keystone users. Um, what Keystone really excels at, though, is not the identity storage or identity management, but the authentication part. Um, and authentication here means proving your identity in some way, proving you are who you say you are. So, Keystone's real power is um, what I'm calling a token service. It provides a bunch of authentication methods, and if you pass these methods, then um, they result in some sort of token. And you can use the token to present to other OpenStack services in your cloud as proof that you've been authenticated, um, which implies that these other services need some way of, of understanding and interpreting and invalidating these tokens. Um, we support a few different token formats. The Fernet format is kind of an older format that's not really well known um, in the rest of the, the, the industry. The newer format we support is JWT. Um, that's, we, we introduced that in the hope that that can, be, um, that can help with adoption outside of an OpenStack context because it's a better supported format. And then in a kind of a limited form, we support uh, SAML assertions as an, uh, uh, it can issue a, a SAML assertion as well, but it's more limited that way. Um, so this is a visualization of how a request would go in OpenStack using Keystone for authentication. Uh, so the user's client needs to make two requests. Uh, it needs to first request a token from Keystone using their credentials, their username and password or whatever it is. 
Um, and then once they get the token, they pass the token as a second request to the service they're actually trying to access. Um, and we have this middleware layer here that uh, intercepts the request and uh, validates that the token is genuine, and validates the user is really authenticated. Um, and then at that point, the service can actually respond with the, the resource that the user is requesting, which is, could be creating a new virtual mis machine or listing your block storage devices or, or what have you. And so Keystone as an authentication service supports uh, a few different types of authentication um, natively. The standard is, of course, just basic password authentication. Um, your user's password is validated against the hash in Keystone, or it's proxied to your LDAP directory for validation. Another way is with application credentials, which is kind of like API keys. Um, it's a way of delegating a narrower, lev narrower level of authorization to your applications without having to give your applications your password. Um, and then we have TOTP, time-based one-time passwords. Um, that's, of course, most useful in a multi-factor auth type of situation. But beyond what Keystone can do natively, it can also support web server auth modules for authentication. So um, if the user is stored in your LDAP or in your SQL database, um, Keystone can use a, a variable from the uh, web server auth module as proof that the user is authenticated. Um, so some examples of this would be X509 client certification, certification, certificate, certificates, or um, Kerberos, or even like um, basic auth, digest auth, anything that Apache supports as an auth module that can be used as authentication with Keystone. And then the more exciting part of Keystone for me is um, federated authentication. It's kind of an extension on external authentication, but in this case, the user needs, uh, they don't need to be stored in the SQL database or the LDAP directory. In this case, they're actually stored in an external identity provider. And then rather than, um, rather than Keystone having direct access to the user's attributes, the user authenticates with some external identity provider, which supports one of these federated protocols like SAML or OpenID Connect. Um, and then uh, an assertion or an attestation is generated by the identity provider, um, which provides Keystone with these user attributes and proves that they're actually authenticated. And then Keystone can use a mapping configured by the cloud operator to um, translate these user attributes into local attributes within Keystone. And in this way, we can achieve a, a federation of identity across multiple clouds or multiple systems. So that was all about the authentication part of Keystone, which Keystone does really well. Um, the, the next part of Keystone that it, that's important is um, authorization, which is about granting the users the right level of, of access um, to the things they need, so making sure that users are allowed to do what they're requesting to do. And this is the part where uh, things get a little bit complicated and Keystone and OpenStack suffer a little bit because um, this is where multi-tenancy makes things a little bit complicated. Um, so Keystone doesn't need to just worry about users logging into OpenStack in general, they need to worry about users logging into a tenant in OpenStack and having per the permissions to do um, what they need to do and not being allowed to do anything else on the system. And so we've called this scoped RBAC because regular role-based access control just doesn't really fully describe the tenancy component of authorization. And so this is all made harder by the fact that we've, the way we've designed OpenStack is these individual components. Um, and that means that a role in Keystone is actually not owned by Keystone, it's owned by the individual service components. So I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, roles are just names in the Keystone database. And what a role means is actually defined in policy rules, uh, which are owned by these other component services. And this is kind of a side effect of uh, how OpenStack is developed and operated as these disjoint, disjoint component services. Um, and so the other services are always creating new APIs, and Keystone doesn't really have the ability or the authority to say what kind of access level each API should have. So we delegate that to the other services. Um, and so the, the defaults for these other services are set 
by the service themselves, and they are, um, the overrides are configured by the cloud operator. Um, this is, is an example of the policy file configuration. It has its own syntax to specify uh, what roles and what scopes are allowed for a given oper uh, operation. And so then a user can't just have a role in OpenStack, they need to have a role and a scope. And so the most basic scope we have is called a project. Um, it's essentially a tenant, it actually used to be called a tenant, but we changed the name. Um, and that's just an abstraction to allow us to group virtual resources, like a group of VMs or a group of disk volumes together, and designate access to each grouping on an individual basis. And then a domain is sort of like a top-level project, but it also allows you to have users and projects within the domain so that um, users can be sort of self-organized. They can create their own users, create their own projects. And then the system scope is a relatively new scope that we've, we've just created. Um, and it's the scope you would use if you actually don't want to do a multi-tenant oper operation, um, but you just want to manage something that's global across the entire cloud or uh, should be hidden from tenant users, like managing your compute hypervisors or managing your Keystone catalog. So then role assignments are what puts the two things together. So in a non-multi-tenant system, you would just say user A has role B, and that would define globally what they're allowed to do within the system. But OpenStack is different because we have the scope component, so um, you have to say, user A has role B on project C. And so with this authorization component, this is a more complete visualization of how a request will work in OpenStack. So the clients, along with their um, username and password, they need to also request a scope from Keystone. Keystone will send back a scoped token. And then in, um, they will still pass that token back to the um, the service that they're trying to request a, a resource from, the token still gets validated with Keystone, but then the, the token is translated into a context for the service to evaluate. Um, and then with that information, the service itself is responsible for uh, deciding whether the user is authorized to do what they're trying to do, which it does with a, a policy library um, and decorators on their API routes. And so if the policy checker passes, um, then the service can grant the resource that the, the user is requesting. And this is kind of getting to the crux of the issue where um, in the early days, OpenStack and Keystone weren't designed so well and um, because components were not and still are not in a lot of cases really accounting for the scope thing in their policy rules. And we, until recently, didn't even have a scope that could properly describe things that weren't tenant operations that were purely system level operations. And so this came about in this long-standing issue. We've, we've documented, it, documented it in a bug report, but it's less of a bug and more of a, an open stack wide design flaw, um, which is where most component services aren't really accounting for um, scope. They're only accounting for role or they're, um, or they're sort of abusing the, the project scope in some way. And the end result is that um, in a lot of cases, having the admin role on some project actually means having the admin role on all projects everywhere across OpenStack, which is obviously not really where you want to be um, and makes it really hard to grant people a fine grain level of access control. Um, at this point, Keystone does support this new system scope, but um, it's a sort of a community effort now to start working with the other component projects and helping them to rewrite their default policies to understand it, um, plus retrain all of the users to use this new scope and rewrite everybody's applications to understand the new scope. So it's, a long, it's an on ongoing effort. And then another problem with this is that the policy rules are managed in the server configuration um, by the cloud operator. So you could have some role, but you don't necessarily know what the role means unless it has a really descriptive name. But um, we're, it, we're sort of violating that principle of discoverability because we can't really discover the specifics of what a role will let you do. And then so, 
not only can tenant users not know ahead of time how a role is defined, they also can't really create roles themselves, which means um, even if you're the administrator of one of these domains for your organization and you can create new users and new projects, you can't really create new roles because you need to rely on the cloud operator to um, create the new role and define it for you across these configuration files with an OpenStack, um, which is uh, a tough job to do and of course, again, violates that self-service um, component. So Keystone excels, I think, at the identity management part and the authentication part, and it can be used outside of OpenStack um, in a lot of ways. It's already, it already can be used for things like Ceph, for things like Kubernetes, um, for, for, this, for this component. And um, with the introduction of the JSON web token format as a, a new format, and with the advancements we're planning for expanding our SAML support, uh, we could even see further adoption of Keystone for identity management for authentication. But for the authorization part, I think the future is kind of fuzzy because, first of all, not all applications outside of OpenStack really need this kind of multi-tenant authorization model, so we wouldn't know how to apply this scoped RBAC thing. Or, in some cases, they already have some existing model of multi-tenancy. Ceph has the, these buckets, Kubernetes has namespaces, um, and the, they don't really map one-to-one -one with Keystone's idea of, of a tenant. So, um, and plus, the way we've, we've delegated policy management to the OpenStack components and not really done it within Keystone itself means it's sort of unclear how you would generalize this to defining roles um, outside of OpenStack. And so similarly for discovery, it's, it's a little bit unclear whether this would even ever be useful outside of an OpenStack context. Um, and there's also already other discovery mechanisms available, so um, that part's a little bit unclear. So in terms of what's next for Keystone, we want to build on our successes with Keystone as an identity management service and as an authentic authentication service by building more functionality into it and building um, what we're calling a proxy identity provider, which could be used to translate authentication information from many external identity providers into some common format. Um, and we could build on our, our work with JSON web, web tokens or on SAML um, to help support this and make this actually a more flexible service to be used with applications outside of OpenStack. Um, to address the authorization issues, we're working with the OpenStack community to bring system scope to all these other components and to help them use them in, these de in their default policies. We were also, uh, at, at one point, working on the idea of bringing the management, oh, sorry, we, we are working on bringing management of, uh, of quotas under, under Keystone, which sort of helps more, um, bring a more consistent multi-tenant user experience to OpenStack as a whole. Um, but beyond that, we haven't really decided how we're going to address um, exposing role definitions to end users. We had thought at one point we could try to move more of this directly under Keystone rather than under the individual OpenStack services, but it was kind of too big of a change and uh, the design we had couldn't really cover the every use case that was out in the wild, so um, it was just too hard at the time. And we also haven't really discussed how we could um, map this authorization model that we have in Keystone to uh, other things outside of OpenStack um, in, a, in a way that wouldn't end up just being a one-off for, for every application. So coming back to these cloud principles, um, when people ask me about this sort of um, the downturn of OpenStack and this hype bubble thing, um, someone asked me once whether OpenStack could survive if all of these big commercial companies, if we all decided to pull out of OpenStack and it became more of like a hobbyist open source project. Um, and the answer is, is yes, it would, it would survive, but it's just not the, the type of project you really work on by yourself. It's not something you install on your personal server in your garage and, and just do things by yourself on. It's, it's all about collaboration. And collaboration is the way we do development, and it's the reason we are building the software. It's the way the software is used. 
And so as long as there is this need for collaborative computing this way, um, we're going to be building this and improving the ways we can, we can automate our infrastructure so that we can actually start um, writing the more exciting things on top of this infrastructure. And so at the center of that is, is Keystone. And so uh, I find a lot of joy in working on that and helping to use Keystone to make supporting team collaboration easier and making it easier to automate your infrastructure. And if you have any interest in, in uh, collaborating and, and uh, contributing to Keystone, or if you have any questions on what I said today, um, feel free to join us on Freenode on our IRC channel or email us on the OpenStack Discuss mailing list. Um, and that is all I had to say about Keystone and multi-tenancy. So thank you everybody so much for, for coming and listening to me. Thank you. Um, I think I have a few minutes for questions. I don't necessarily want to hold everybody hostage here. I know the beer is calling and the sunshine is calling. Um, but I also have stickers up here if anybody wants some Keystone mascot stickers or I'll also hang out here for a few minutes if you um, have any one-on-one -on -one questions you want to ask me. Um, are there any questions from the room? All right, thank you. Have a good day.